we're going to talk about how those sampling plans are developed. And there's kind of four steps. The first is you identify your population. Which, which target population do you need to understand and are you trying to get information for? We need to explain the sampling method and why we use that method to describe what your sample size should be and what that sample would look like. And then you describe how you'll obtain the information from that sample. Now we haven't gotten into the data collection methods yet, but you have to have a general idea whether you're going to do a qualitative or quantitative analysis and whether you're gonna use a survey or we'll get to that in a minute. So first, you need to consider your population as a whole Think about what you're trying to obtain from them and then kind of identify what specific characteristics in your population need to be sampled for appropriately. Does socioeconomic factor matter? Um, ethnicity, gender, age, zip code, employment, all of those things could have an influence. It just depends on your question, right? So whatever your purpose of the evaluation, there's going to be some kind of characteristic of your population that you need to make sure that you're considering. It would be nice if we could just say we're going to do a simple random sample and it will just capture everything. But we already talked about how simple random samples can sometimes miss those groups of people that are really important in getting the information. You also need to know what the size of your population is. So is it only 1,000 or is it 50 million? Your target population is the group that we're trying to project the results upon, okay? So if you're doing an evaluation for a statewide program, you want to be able to um, extrapolate or apply those findings from your evaluation onto the total population. So you have to consider that total population before you get your sample. In some cases, you're only working with a small group, like high school kids in a particular geographic area. So your sample or your target population obviously isn't as large, and so you don't have to consider many of those factors. But that's something you have to kind of think in your mind and, and start to process. One of the things that you need to consider or think about is how diverse the population is. And one of, you know, in the United States culture of diversity, we automatically think of identities, <clears throat> right? Either your ethnicity or some other factor that you identify with. But diversity has to do with a whole lot more than that. Um, and it's not just these socioeconomic factors either. Um, how diverse is the group in their thinking, their cultural norms, their um, expectations? And you can see that even in smaller groups. Think about a, a small private Catholic high school versus a um, very large city-based city high school. The diversity in those groups is going to be different, right? Just in, and not just in class, like socioeconomic class either. It's going to be academics based and it's gonna have a lot of other characteristics that we normally wouldn't probably associate with diversity, but one group's gonna be pretty diverse and the other one's not. And vice versa, sometimes small groups have a lot more diversity on purpose because of the way they select. And then finally, uh, one of the things is that you have to really think about is does your study require information from small population groups? If it doesn't, then some of the other methods might be fine. But if you need information from small groups, then that's gonna limit your methodologies. And so you're gonna have to pick a different method will ensure that you get small group representation, like that clustered sampling where you take equal representation from each group. So here's some things to think about. So if this was your population based on age, just because it was easy to kind of identify, and you had you know 10,000 kids, 16,000 young adults, 26,000 uh, middle-aged adults, and then some older folks, some things to ask yourself is, do I need to include children in my population group? And that depends on what you're trying to address with your evaluation, right? So you, you might, but you, these are some of the questions you ask as you're identifying your population. Uh, what's the target group? Is there a subgroup of, of that target that you want to have more information about? 
how else could you split up your group? We just spent a little bit of time talking about making sure that we have an ad adequate representation. And then the, the idea of randomness, can you just rely on randomness to give you a good, a good sample? And you may, and you may not. So that's identifying our population. The next piece is explaining what sampling methods um, you would like to use. So not just, um, I'm going to use the snowball sample method and leave it blank. Yeah, You need to give some depth. Like, how are you going to start that? What is your, what is your process? Why did you pick that method? What, what makes you pick that method versus a standard convenience or a grab sample? So you need to have some detail because every method has strengths and weaknesses, right? And so you need to kind of magnify the strengths of that method and explain how the weaknesses really don't matter. This is going to take, you know, a couple paragraphs, maybe three. If you're precise with your words, you can probably get it, get this down to three paragraphs. And this is the method and this is how I'm going to do it. And this is why I'm going to do it. If you're rambling and telling 16 stories, including Hansel and Gretel, while you're telling, writing your technical paper, well, then you're just wasting your time and mine and everybody else's, but um, then it's going to take you much, much longer. Once you've identified your population and you've determined how you're going to go about sampling them, we can get to the sample size. This is always a tricky question. If you've had statistics, there's some stupid reason that everybody remembers that the sample size, the minimum sample size for any sample is 30, which is completely wrong in every particular fact. In fact, it's usually either smaller or much larger. It's rarely 30. And the reason is our sample needs to represent the population. So think about that. There's 24,000 students who currently are students at BYU-Idaho. Is 30 enough to get a representation of 24,000 people? Even if it was random, it's not a very big sample. So obviously what we're trying to figure out, how much difference there is between groups, all sorts of other things play into the, to the calculation of sample size. There is an actual calculation you can look it up uh, online for sample size. I don't encourage you to do so because it's calculus and nobody understands calculus. Calculus is um, a Harry Potter math. That's the only best way to explain that. Instead, really smart people have built tables and charts that let you just look stuff up on sample size. We're gonna look at that in just a minute. The size of the population will impact the size of your sample, but only to a certain point. After, you know, 4 million or so, 300 million population doesn't change your sample size. You, you, you're still going to have the same sample size. Up until a fairly large number, your, your population will determine how large your sample needs to be. Now, you already decided what characteristics were important, right, a couple of slides ago, or you will have already done that. So that's going to also influence, because in the sampling process for your, for your sample, you may take your population and break it down into subgroups, like age or ethnicity or socioeconomic status, and say, Okay, this makes up 30% of my sample. I need to make sure that that characteristic is represented and I'm going to get 30% of it. Or 30% of my total sample is going to look like that. You may even have to, to pick a methodology that's different for some groups than for others. We discussed that a little bit on Monday. If you were trying to get information from older people, people 65 and older, and your primary sampling method is convenience email survey, then you may have to use a different sampling method for your older group population, right? You may have to use a convenient sample for them. You can do that, but that's based on how you broke up your population earlier and now how you're going to go about how, how important that particular group's information is. So when you think about things that have extreme differences, think about socioeconomic status in New York City. You're either super rich, mostly rich, or super poor. Because of that, in your sampling methodology, you would need to make sure your sample size was large enough in each of those three groups. If you just did random, you'd probably just get a whole bunch of people who work on Wall Street, middle class, right? And you wouldn't get the other extremes. 
you may have to get a larger sample to get out to those edges. Remember we we made that bell-shaped curve in a population? Well, when your population doesn't look like a bell-shaped curve and instead it looks like three big humps, now you have to be able to sample in order to collect on the ends and the middle, not just in the middle. Um, thinking about how homogenous your group is, we kind of talked about that a little bit with the characteristics of the population, but a homogenous group, you probably don't need as large a sample size. So with 26,000 students at BYU-Idaho, 30 is probably not enough, but maybe 150 is, even though when we get to the sample size chart, you'll see that they would recommend much larger sample. This is a sample size chart. It's based on your confidence level. If you've had statistics, this will make sense. If you haven't, it probably won't. Confidence level is your chance of being wrong if you say there's a difference between two things, which seems really complicated, but it just means how, how right do you feel when you're done with your analysis? That's your confidence level. And the margin of error is your willingness, how much kind of space. You guys have seen this. The, for instance, the margin of error for an A at BYU-Idaho is between 93 and 100%, right? But an A- minus is only 90 to 93. That's the margin of error. So um, some people are willing to have a margin of error or difference in their groups. Uh, um, of five, a spread of five percentage points. Sometimes you only want 10%. So you can see, you know, up to 30 people in your population, you need to sample almost everybody. At 1,000, you notice that's the only place that 30 is on the chart. Anybody know? Well, over here, but this is, this is a confidence error of 99%. So that 30 is the sample size. That's the only time, this spot right there is the only time you see 30, and that's the whole population. On that, like 26,000, we would expect, even with a broad sample size, 378 as our sample size, even with a broad, broad spread. And this is what I was talking about, that in a homogenous group like BYU-Idaho, we might get away with half of that. Notice, after 250,000, sample size is the same all the way down to 300 million, even up till, I mean, 384 to 300, you know, 2,500 down to 300 million is essentially the same number. And these are valuable tools. You're welcome to use this table. So I would take a picture of it or some other method. Now, you also need to um, describe how you're going to get the information. So this is where it kind of all comes together. Some of you have used the idiom before, where the rubber meets the road, and if you've never heard that before, you can look it up. It's an American idiom. Essentially, we've taken the population, we've taken the sample size, we've taken our method, and now we gotta describe how we're going to get that information get the data we need from that group of people the way we say we're going to get it. And so the process that we're going to get the information is important. Are we going to do it through a qualitative measure like a focus group, an interview, or a, a record review? Or are we going to do it quantitatively through observation, through um, a survey, through uh, also quantitative interview? Is there other kind of strategy? And you need to at least have a general idea of which uh, strategy you're going to use to get that information. You don't have to have all the answers. We haven't covered that part in the course, but you do need a general process and the implementation of that process too. Are you going to do a survey? Okay. Are you going to send it electronically? Are you going to do a paper pencil? Or are you going to do a combination? Are you going to do a focus group? How are you going to recruit your focus group? You don't have to get into super specific details here. That, that comes later in our procedure process. Um, the, you'll actually learn about in your research methods class. But you do need to kind of bring it all together here with this in, the, the strategy you plan to use to collect the data. Then you write it all down. Start by describing your population. Then how many people you propose to sample and their characteristics, and if you're gonna break it up into subgroups, 
again, this will come back to your sampling method. So these two might blend together. It won't be like, and your sampling method may bleed over to your proposed sample size because your method might be a stratified clustered sample. And then you just spend time telling us about that. Explain why you're using the method that you're using. And then finally that last piece. And that's the process for a sampling plan.